Hi, it's Steve Hargett on, and this is what was to have been the closing keynote for the Gaming and Ed Conference, but because Michael Levine had a family emergency, he will be giving, this is the penultimate closing keynote. He uh, had to move his keynote to sometime next week. But Barbara, it's so fun to conclude with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks to BrainPop. Allison is in the room. She's in the house. Thanks for the support. It's been a really fun day. Lots of good sessions. Hopefully a really great repository of sessions on gaming and education. Thanks to ASB Online Academy as well and Blackboard Collaborate. So those of you who are participating live in our studio audience, this is your chance to tell us where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. Click on the map. Click twice on the star and then click on the map. And put a shout out in the chat to Phoenix, of course, Baltimore, Maryland, and Florida, Miami. Oh, good. We're now international. Oh, I thought we were. <laughs> a rogue star. Anyway, let us know. And I'm going to move forward so that Barbara has as much time as she needs. So, Barbara, I'm here at your service. I'll take care of the videos and the um, surveys, and we'll go from there. Wonderful. Well, hello, everybody. This has been such an interesting uh, conference. I, I've done webinars before, but I've never done a full online virtual conference like this. So for me, it was a great opportunity to participate in that way. And, you know, just thanks again for all the folks who made this happen. Steve, you and Amy have been great, and Allison, everyone who sponsored this and put it together. It's really been a great resource. I've enjoyed the sessions I've had a chance to sit in on. And there's a few I'm going to go back and watch the recordings for. So thanks so much for doing that. And for those of you who joined us today, hey, good to see you. Good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening. I think that might cover everybody. Um, I noticed in watching some of the other sessions that one of the things Blackboard does is when there's a lag in connectivity, it then plays it really fast to catch up. So I'm going to apologize now because I tend to talk very quickly and I cannot even imagine the harm that would be done in Blackboard speeding me up two times to catch me up. So I'm going to try to speak with a nice even pace so that I don't kill anybody trying to listen to this if it goes double time. All righty. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things I like to talk about uh, when it comes to game-based learning, and I actually like being the capstone speaker, or in this case, the penultimate speaker, since Michael Levine's going to speak next week, um, because it's such an opportunity when you've had your brain filled with all of these things that you've learned, and we've heard so much about gamification and game-based learning, that I, I love this last slot because it gives you the chance to just kind of slow things down a little bit and reflect on what we've heard. And if you are in a games and education conference, obviously you have a bias that you are at least interested in using games in education, or you have used games in education, or you create games for education, any of the above. So what I want to talk about is how we convert the unconverted. How do we help the people who say, game-based learning, I'm not so sure, because sometimes it's hard it's hard to convince them. We are so firmly meshed in this world, it's hard to convince them. So I wanted to do that today and kind of walk us as a group through some of these, these, um, these thoughts that will help you make the case. So just a little bit about me. New Mexico State University is weird. We have a learning games lab, which is a professional game development studio at the university. So it's not grad students and students, but certainly we have some of those. Um, it's a professional development space and all of the games we develop and educational media and simulations and apps and and uh, interactions and video are all based on uh, university research, either ours or any of our partners across the world that we work with. So. But I don't want to talk about our stuff. We're going we're gonna to go up a couple levels, and we're going to talk about gaming. Now, I like to share this picture when I talk for a number of reasons. Um, this, I used to be a stand-up comic, and this is my headshot about um, 20 years ago. So I like to 
to share this for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is first, to take pictures of yourself when you're in your 20s. Whatever. We're getting all the indications that Barbara's uh, connection has really slowed down. I see these three red dots next to her name, which indicate to me as the moderator that she's in a death spiral with her internet connection. So which likely means she's going to drop off where she just did. And she will log back on. And we'll try again. <laughs> What well, fun to see this photo. I can't wait to hear the rest of the story. Yeah, I, I will make that recommendation, Peggy, although it will be unfortunate not to see her animated face. We have a minute here waiting for her to come back. If you had a discovery today or you learned something interesting, would you put a note in the chat and let us know? If you're really excited, would you raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone? Typically, if someone takes this long to come back, they've either had a computer problem or there's an internet problem at their facility. And we'll see if Barbara calls me or emails independently. I'm checking to see. Sarah says the five steps to gamification was great. <laughs> Fun. I have a hard time believing, Peggy, that you didn't think before that learning should be fun. Again, this length of a delay probably means that um, Barbara's having some other kind of issue. Oh, so Allison knows. So tell her, uh, Allison, if you'd like, that I can bring her in by telephone. Let me give you the number. So have her come in. I'm hoping you have something to write with. Oh, and let me, I can copy this and put it in the chat. Hang on. So don't anyone else use that number, but that number is for Barbara. Well, it looks like she may be back. Barbara, if you can hear us, we're delighted that you're back. If this was an internet slowdown, hey there. Gonna, hey, is, hey. is this an internet slowdown that's going to All right, no video. Barbara, do you think this is a slowdown, or was that just a, like a complete shut off for a moment? Will your internet continue to be slow, do you think?
Oops, just gone into Audio Setup Wizard. Here for a moment. Oh, the fun, the fun. Of course, this has this happens at the last session of the day. You know, and I'm still seeing those indicators of an internet issue for her. I wonder if it would be best for her to do telephone. Oh, she just dropped off again. Allison, if you're in touch with her, then uh, I think I would suggest the telephone. It's not definite, but the both times she dropped off, the, we got the I got the visual cues that it was an internet issue on her end. And if that's the case, telephone will probably be best. And I'm glad to be the slide guy. Oh, looks like she's back. Barbara, before I uh, make you a moderator again, I just want you to know that both times I got a visual cue that your internet connection was really low. And so don't try turning your video on this time. It's hard for us because we'd like to see your animated face, but I think probably better not to turn video on. And if you want to try turning the talk button on, then we can see how you're doing. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm wondering, we're having a lot of rain here and flooding. And often when we have flooding, it makes our internet go out. I don't know if they starve the internet routers in the basement or what happens. Um, do you want to try phone or do you want to just try talk? Why don't you go until you drop off again and then use that phone number to call us if you drop off again. Okay, can you put that in chat for me? I can. All righty. Okay, so is this where we left off? Me and my 20? Uh, yeah, but that's actually just about where you stopped for us. Oh, okay. okay. You said make sure you take pictures of yourselves in your 20s. <laughs> yes, because you're always going to look back. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Peggy. Okay, so you always take pictures of yourself in your 20s or whatever age you are because you always look back and say, oh, my gosh, I look fabulous, right? In retrospect, I remember looking at this picture. Oh, thanks, Teresa. I look at this picture, and I remember at this age thinking, oh, my stomach is so poochy and my arms are so fat. But, of course, this is what I look like now, and, you know, it, it yeah. So <laughs> 20 years later. But the reason I like to show that picture is because I was a stand-up comic. And so I like to think I knew something about having fun or certainly about helping people know how to have fun. And I thought seriously about that being my career. And instead I fell in love with something different. And this is what I fell in love with. And it wasn't, of course, um, Angry Birds that I fell in love with, though I certainly love it now. But this is what inspires me. And I know that many of you have played Angry Birds, and many of you have maybe even played Angry Birds <clears throat> in the bathroom. You know, maybe played Angry Birds while waiting for your kids at piano lesson or <clears throat> at a meeting or any, you know, not you. Other people play at these times. But what I love about Angry Birds is with a billion downloads worldwide, my mother has played Angry Birds. We suddenly now have a world full of people who previously would never have admitted to playing games. But now suddenly people are willing to play games and admit they play games because people are understanding what is powerful about gameplay. This is a picture that my son, when he was four, drew me in preschool. Um, I came and picked him up. It was free draw time, and he said, I have a picture for you. And, of course, whenever you see a child's picture, you never compliment them on it. You always ask them to tell you about it so that you don't compliment their wonderful dragon when it was, in fact, an ice cream cone. So I, he showed me this picture, and I said, this is wonderful. Tell me, what is it? And he said, well, in the middle you have a flower. And on the left, you have a snowman, and on the right, you have a computer. And you use the arrows to select which picture you want, and then you hit the select button at the top. And I was 
blown away. First off, I think this is how doctors must feel when they see kids playing doctor, because I am a game developer, and my son had drawn his first interface, and I was so proud. But it also showed with great clarity. We talk about kids on iPhones these days and kids on devices, but let me tell you what my four-year-old understood. He understood the power of interactivity. He understood that I shouldn't have to look at the picture he wanted to draw just because that's what he was drawing. He understood autonomy. He understood the importance of getting to select what you want and have some kind of voice in that selection. And this is the generation that we have now as learners. And thanks to Angry Birds and everyone around the world at any age playing games, even people who didn't have iPhones as kids are starting to understand what the power is here. So I don't want to talk about games for a minute. I want to talk about museums. One of my other loves. This is the Explora Children's Museum in Albuquerque. And um, I'm sure you have children's museums or you've been to children's museums. And these are my kids um, on the first day of a week-long camp at Explora Museum. And you can see they are very happy. <laughs> and I'll tell you, these kids spent six hours every day for a week at that camp. And I came and picked them up, and we stayed an extra two hours because they did not get enough of the museum. And this is where we spent a lot of our time. So this, you just walk into the, the, the beginning, and they have this room where you can go through and kind of build um, devices and put pegs in the wall and make balls follow the, the, the path. And some of them are labeled with with numbers there's there's different kinds of things and we spent at least an hour here every day um, the same kind of thing a different thing you can do the thing on the wall you can do the pass with the balls and um, this is perhaps one of the most important places because uh, that's where the adults sit it's <laughs> really so sit for an hour or two hours. You know, we engage at first. We we are absolutely in there at first, engaging with them. And after a while, we're like, okay, I'm just going to sit here while you play. And they do that for hours. And I think, okay, what is it that makes kids' museums, and what's the right word? Is it worthwhile? Is it um, effective? Is it engaging? Is it valuable because kids museums even parents that I know who don't you know have PhDs in education <laughs> which most of us don't you know who maybe aren't first and foremost educators or teachers or say education is the most important thing they still know that there is something worthwhile and valuable and effective and wonderful about museums and explorers they have more kids wanting to do field trips there than they can shake a stick at and every time I talk to someone about Albuquerque they say oh my kids love the Explorer Museum so I want you to think for a minute and just have a piece of paper there in front of you with a pen and and um, I want you to just answer this question for yourself, if you would. If you want to put something in chat, we're a small group, we could do that. What is it that makes kids museums effective, engaging, valuable, worthwhile? And while you're doing that, um, just one or two words, keep it short. There might be three or four different things you want to capture. I want to show you some more pictures of the museums. So this is the laminar flow fountain. Um, water spurts into it from different locations. And throughout, there's buttons that you can press the button, and it'll make a, a fountain go. Of course, you don't really know which fountain it does, so you run around and you hit all the buttons till you do. This is one of their things on ratio. You can put weights, either one or two weights, on the side, and you can see what a two weight on the floor equals on the other side. Um, of course, we've all seen these mirrors. Um, we all kind of have our favorite mirrors to stand in front of. The bubble tank. Boy, if we weren't at that wall making pads with balls, we were at the bubble tank. This is one of those fabulous little water flow things. Now, you know, you can, you can do one path and see how fast it can flow. You can try to make water go uphill. You can put all the balls in one place and see if you can move them down. You know, just anything that makes your elbows and sleeves wet. Here's a, just uh, lots of different shapes you could put into the water. I'm seeing some great things in the, in the text there. So this is my son. It's one of those bikes that's weighted on the bottom. You, there's no way to make that fall. I mean, it's pretty heavily weighted. And every day he went, he got on it, and he went out, and then he came back. And then we went back the next day, and he went out a little bit further, and then he came back. And by the time we were done, he had taken that all the way down to the end. So you notice there's a mic here, some sound activities, music, looking at width of bars and the different sounds they make. Um, you pull this up to 
disc. You're supposed to get the disc from the bottom to the top without dropping it in the hole. And of course, you're, the first time you do it, you're going to drop a ball in the hole, right? Everybody does. Um, color table, you can just put those in whatever order you want. This is like in an auditorium, so you have an audience where everyone sees the colors you put together. Yeah, I have no idea what this thing does. There's some kind of input and output and cables. I don't know. You just kind of play with it. So, so what is it that makes this learning fun? There, you know, there's hundreds of ways we could describe that. But let me give you my take on it. First, it's interactive. And I've seen some different words that you all have used for that interactivity. But there's no lectures here. There's no one-way learning here. It's interactive. Secondly, it's open-ended. You know that water play table? You could make the water go very fast. You could make it go slow. You could make it go uphill. You could make it go sideways. You as the learner get to decide. You, um, it's different each time for each learner. My six-year-old has a different experience than my 10-year-old. And they both have different experiences when, when they went and it was, they were eight and four. And it's different depending on who they're with, if it's a parent or a grandparent or each other or another kid. These activities give immediate feedback. When you hit that button on the fountain, you can immediately see which fountain goes off. When you drop that ball in that board, you know immediately that it has happened. This is assisted learning. Um, in Vygotsky's terms, there's a, a more capable other, whether it's the signage on the exhibit or there's a museum employee or a parent who's with you. And it's always age appropriate. Now, this is not unique to museums, as you can probably guess the trend. This is actually the same kind of thing that I think makes anything fun. <laughs> you want all of these characteristics when you're learning to um, design a cake or uh, refit an engine or you're learning some kind of new technology. Whatever it is that is fun, you want, you want these things in it as well. Because the truth is that learning is fun. We don't have to dress up learning to make it fun. Learning is fun. And in the words of my friends Darren Karstens, art's job is to not screw that up. And we do that sometimes. We do that, and I'm sorry, the fonts got all crazy when um, we ported these over, so it's kind of a creative activity to, to read the words in the correct order here. So it says, learning is fun. Our job is to not screw that up. And we screw it up not because we're evil or incompetent or mean or ignorant. We screw it up for efficiency. We screw it up because we try to think the most efficient way to have somebody learn what we want them to learn that we know, and we assume the most efficient way to do that is to tell them. And we do that over and over and over again. And that can be efficient, but maybe not always effective. Now, play is all of these things as well. This is what makes museums good at what makes things fun. And this is what play is about. And games are about play. Now, people ask me all the time, can games help people learn? And that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, it's equal in importance to this question, or uh, this question, or maybe um, this question, or maybe pencils and paper, or books, or can doing a worksheet with 22 other second graders help people learn? Because these are all educational approaches that we use regularly. Yet they don't meet with the same resistance that gameplay does. We take for granted that these things are educational because they look educational. They have a serious feel about them. And we assume there is rigor associated with them. Now, if we can just step back from that for a minute, let's really think about what games can do. Now, many people have a bias, and we each have different biases. That's one of the things that makes this unique. But if I were to tell you that, that student A played two hours of video games every day, and person B spent the same two hours every day writing thoughts that were important to him, think in your mind what you think is the better use of time. And think what your parents would say, or your administrators would say, or your colleagues would say. And many people, and sometimes I worry I might even think, that that person playing games for two hours is wasting their time. It's two hours of screen time. But what if person A was doing extra games? 
because they have a self-image issue or a physical problem or they just can't, they're place-bound and they can't exercise any other way. And they can do extra games in the privacy of their own room and do yoga and, and aerobic activity. Or what if person A is a high school student and trigonometry isn't offered in her rural school and she can play online games? Or what if person A is solving problems about the environment or are playing a multiplayer game about um, ethical decisions? Or what if that A game time is all in a class with other learners and teachers? And what if person B is the Unabomber writing a manifesto in a shack? The point with this isn't that video games are good or bad or writing is good or bad. The point is it doesn't matter what the device is. The point is, what matters is the activity. Not necessarily just the content, but the activity. Now, the cardinal rule of educational technology is if the technology doesn't do it better, don't use it. And I have my phone and my laptop and my iPad, and I use technology all the time. And when I design something, my first question is, how will technology make this better? Because if it doesn't make it better, if hands-on is better, if it's more efficient, more effective, more engaging in any other way, you do that first. But there are ways technology makes it better. So here's a survey, and see if you can maybe help me out here. Tell me from your perspective today, those of you that are online, why are you here? Do you want me to convince you that gameplay is important? Or do you want me to help you convince parents, administrators, colleagues that gameplay is important? Blue. Wonderful, okay. I'm looking in the quotes, that's a fine way. If you want to respond in the quotes, that's fine. We need to let stakeholders see connection between learning standards. Yep, convince parents, A or B. Higher ups that gameplay is important for college students. Okay, so let me help you kind of shape your argument. Okay, now gameplay changes things. And here's one of the ways. It allows learning to be self-directed. We have so few opportunities for students in our schools from K-12 and in postgraduate or in uh, undergrad or grad programs where learning gets to be self-directed. In college, they get to pick the major in some of the classes, but that's about it. And in K-12, they rarely get to be self-directed. But we can create self-directed moments of learning within any curriculum that they're doing, and Gameplay lets you do this. Let's go back to this fabulous, fabulous board that was an Explora. As we spent an hour in that room, I was sitting there thinking, gosh, the boys are learning so much here about physics and about motion and and I, I wonder if I could build one of these boards in my house. You know, I could probably do that. I could probably devote some space and get one of those pegboards, and we could replicate that. You know, what's nice about this board is you have kind of this path, and then you can go into the middle and put the middle thing up and the bottom thing down or the thing on the right up or down, and you just get to do it over and over again until you can get that ball from the left into the right if that's what you want to do. And then I realized I don't have to rebuild this board because I already have the board, and that board is in Minecraft. When I played, watched my son play Minecraft, he um, was, we had it in safety mode, so he wasn't building to get away from monsters or creepers or any of that. He had built a zoo with animals, and he had put a roller coaster around the outside of the zoo. And I watched him for two hours. Now, my son has ADHD, and generally speaking, um, if he's not if he's not on medication, which has been so helpful to him, but if he's not, we have about 10 minutes he can sit and focus. That blood just is not moving through his brain, usually, to help him focus. It has to be extremely, extremely engaging to him. Two hours, I sat and watched him try to get the cart to go up the hill, down the hill, and back up over the hill. And he lowered the bottom part, and then he raised the top part, then he lowered the top part, then he raised the bottom part until he was able to get that toaster to go through it. And this is in a game. Now, we could have gone to a book, and we could have looked at diagrams, and we could have studied force and motion. We could have done all of that. But none of that is as powerful as him being put into an environment where he has a question and where he's able to experiment until he finds the answer to suit his needs. And that's what this game did. 
And that's what other kids are doing in Minecraft or any kind of a building activity. Not only are they building their spatial cognition, which is tremendous when working in a 3D space, they are able to collaborate with others. They want to figure out how to do something. There's not a manual in Minecraft. You don't go to the help button in Minecraft. You go to a community of learners and you have someone teach it to you. It is the most beautiful example I have seen of a game-based learning environment where the learner has to go seek out knowledge for herself or for himself. And that is why it is so powerful. There's a, an archery range that my nephew had built so they could practice doing archery. And if you have looked at Minecraft at all, you have seen the tremendous variety that learners have done in this. And they aren't doing it because they are assigned to do it. They are spending hours constructing and building and playing with physics and art because they've had an open-ended ability to do so. So why is Minecraft so powerful? What's powerful about self-directed learning in Minecraft or in any kind of game is that the learner sets his or her own goals. That activity should be inquiry-based. If at some point the learner is saying, huh, I wonder if, then it's inquiry-based. And then they're able to ask their question and find the answers with guidance. Players create a community of learners, and the game gives immediate feedback. You put that uh, uh, um, block in a place, you can immediately see if it's there. You put an experiment in with Redstone, you can immediately see if it works. Okay, so let me take you a slightly different way. Minecraft, I know my kids can play on that for hours. I have to go in sometimes and pull them off and get them to do other things. So you tell me. Um, the ideal amount of screen time is, A, as little as possible, B, no more than two hours a day, three, no more than four hours a day, or it does not matter. Anybody want to pop into chat and, and weigh in? You can tell I've got a bias here, right? Or does anyone want to tell me what the American Association of Pediatricians recommends? Love it, Sarah. Now, I usually don't want to talk about time, screen time because everybody talks about screen time, and I'll be honest with you, it annoys me. It annoys me when I have people passing out handouts that say, turn off the screen and live life. Instead of being on the screen, you could read a book or listen to music or connect with a friend or get exercise because all of these things can be done with the screen. So let me tell you another great thing about gameplay and how it changes things. Gameplay can provide screen time. That's right. I said it. It can provide screen time. I'm no longer going to pretend screen time is a bad thing or shy away from it. I am starting to say that one of the best things about games is it gives kids the screen time they need and deserve. Oh, I know the biases. We've seen this on Facebook. First off, it's not true. He never said this. <laughs> We're seeing these kinds of things. The day Albert Einstein feared has arrived. I fear technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. I like these things. All this technology is making us antisocial. <laughs> when they're with the news, they're not talking to each other. You don't want to talk to somebody. You're not going to talk to them whether you have a phone in front of you or not. We know that um, the, the fear, of course, is that technology will make us rude to others, that we have poor manners, that we don't know how to engage with a real person. And you all have seen this in users of technology. I have seen this in users of technology. We have all seen some of the worst abusers of technology, and we know the people who are made rude by technology. We know the people who have poor manners, and we know the people who can't get off their phone and have decent manners or how to engage, and here's a picture of them. To these people. <laughs> I want to clarify. The reason that so many times our seniors can be rude to others with technology or poor manners, we've seen they have a the phone ringing there in the middle of the place. They pick up the phone. They just start talking wherever they're at because they don't know how to, how to turn it off or they don't know how to text or they um, talk very loudly. The reason they do these things isn't because they're rude or poor manners. It's because they didn't grow up with the technology. They don't know how to text with just using their thumbs inside their pocket. They don't have the, the um, hearing capacity to tell when they're talking too loudly or not. They haven't learned some of the rules about how to use technology, and that's okay. That's okay. I love that they are using technology and embracing it. We are going to give them a free pass when they sometimes are, are using technology in an inappropriate way because they're new to it and they're using it. We love them, 
but they have adopted the technology and they don't always know the best way to use it. Some of them, not all, but some of them. Okay, but what about this guy? This guy had a phone in his hands. Look at how young he is. He's not even two and he's using it. How is that kid going to grow up to know how to use technology appropriately? How is he going to learn how to integrate it into his life? Because he needs to. This kid is going to have it integrated into every area of his life. Here's an app we made for livestock record keeping. He's going to use it for paying bills. He is going to use it to chat with others, to learn from different people, to connect with people in a variety of different ways. Here's an app we made for calorie balance. That kid's going to be using it. Right now, I'm a university professor. I'm fully tenured, and more people find me from my YouTube talks than from my publications. That's the way it is. This is my uh, my husband's aunt. A few years ago, we were doing some research on um, games. We have in our game lab, we have kids that come in all the time. And uh, we do research on our games and also new trends. And so about, about, oh gosh, 10 years ago, we would have the kids come in and play. And we noticed a couple of things. First off, whenever they were playing games that had physical activity, they were more engaged. And when their parents or their grandparents would come to pick them up, these were the games that the adults would play with them. Because it was easier. It looks like a drum. You play it like a drum. It looks like a guitar. You play it like a guitar. And so we did a huge research project on extra games because we thought this is going to change how everybody moves and get exercise. And we wanted to look about how games can be integrated into lives. And so we put them into schools. We put them into doctor's waiting offices. We put them into public environments. And what we found was so inspiring that these didn't decrease use of other activities. In some way, they provided a gateway. Steve, if you can, I think this would be a good place to put that first movie up for the extra games. I wanted to share this because it tells you just a little bit. And we're not going to go all the way through, Steve, but we're going to just tell you a little bit about some of what we've learned with our extra games project. Okay, I'm going to put the link uh, in the chat as well as putting it into the web tour. If the web tour doesn't play right away for you, then click on the link in the chat to open your own browser. Research has shown that small bouts of physical activity are beneficial to students in a number of ways. Conley Elementary in Las Cruces, New Mexico has Okay, so that we can return back to the presentation, if you would, please. And you can watch that. You can go to Extra Games Unlocked and watch that or some of the other videos. But they found tardies decreased. They did it first thing in the morning. The kids had to be there in time or they wouldn't get to go into the classroom. They'd have to wait in the hall. And tardies and absences decreased as a way of using that. And, of course, the kids were then physically active throughout the day. And that was just for five minutes of activity a day. Peggy, I'm sorry it never loaded. Did any of the rest of you see that video? Yes, okay, so a few of you did. Okay, um, this is a really interesting study. Thanks, Steve, for putting that up if any of y'all want to watch that later. Um, so this is an interesting study. They took 90 smokers who wanted to quit, and they put them through a, previously, a, a, a study that had previously proven successful for most people who wanted to quit smoking to help them quit smoking. And they took this, and they um, put the, they developed a game where the users wear a virtual helmet, and they go around this community, and they would go around picking up, trying to find things and smashing them. And both groups did the exact same thing. They all went through the same activity, the, the learning, the smoking cessation program, and then they had the opportunity to be in one of two groups. One group went around picking up cigarettes and physically smushing them with their hands, well, virtually smushing them. But they had to use their hands to pretend and be are there smushing them. And the other group did the same thing, but with green balls. Um, they spent 
four weeks, half an hour for each of four weeks. So total exposure to this treatment was only two hours. That's the only difference of the group. Everybody had two hours of gameplay over four weeks running around the city picking up either green balls or cigarettes. And the users who picked up cigarettes, had a higher self-efficacy rate, a higher consistency program. They stayed in the program. And when they finished, that higher self-efficacy that they believed they would not start smoking again. And that was just the cigarettes. We see tremendous behavioral changes in games like Zanzi. Now, this is a good example of gamification, okay? Gamification is about giving rewards for behavior. And the belief is that if you can give people rewards for changing behavior, that will ultimately get them to change their behavior until it's intrinsic, and they have made that change. And Zanzi is a beautiful use of that. They have pedometers for kids. The kids can go online and meet challenges and, and earn rewards for getting to different levels of physical activity. My point is, don't fear the pixel, whether it's a smoking cessation program or after um, a, a, a pedometer or a game online or um, Minecraft. We get so hung up on screen time. My message to people is to don't fear the pixel. And I think if you can help your parents and your administrators first get over this fear of technology as a bad thing, they will see that a pixel can be about reading. It can be about art. It can be about communication. That's a picture of me um, doing good night eye chats with my boys when I'm on the road traveling. It can be about extra gaming, and it can be about communicating. This is a workshop I did on manners with high school kids. Um, you know, they're so rarely put into social situations where they can learn how to work at a formal banquet or at a reception. So I, I made a game for them, and part of it was doing research online before they went into the situation. So don't fear the pixel. It's not about the technology, it's about the activity. All right, gameplay changes things. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna, we're gonna skip through this, but gameplay facilitates teaching. Later on, get this URL if you put that. This is kid snippets about teaching math. It's a fun video, it's gonna make you laugh. We didn't put this one together, these are some entertaining. So if you'll put that, go watch that later and you'll get a good chuckle out of it. But gameplay can facilitate teaching. We have a program called Math Snacks. Um, that uh, it teaches math for concepts that kids have a difficult time with in, in sixth grade. And it focuses largely on um, games that can be used in the classroom. Now, the reason it facilitates teaching is it ex enables exploration. You know, Piaget, who, who started you know, so much of what we know of constructivist learning now, said, are we forming children who are only capable of learning what is already known. And so much of our instruction is focused on that, isn't it? <laughs> we're gonna outline exactly what we want them to know and we're gonna teach them that. And we sometimes forget about the importance of them learning how to solve problems so that they can solve the problems we don't know the answers to. So I'm getting the dreaded three red dots again from Barbara, which indicates that she is having a, an internet issue again, which I'm guessing is the water flooding problem. <laughs> We've made it so far. She's still in the room, but all indications would be that in a moment she will drop off. Oh, she just dropped off. So hopefully she has the phone number she can call back in. What a trooper. Felt like we were so close. Allison, we have a minute here. I don't know if you want to say anything. If you don't give any plugs, express any appreciation for anyone. If you do, I'll give you the microphone. I don't want to put you on the spot. 
Oh, here comes Barbara through phone, I think. We think we hear you, Barbara. Are you there? There you are. Hey, can you hear me okay? You can. So you're on Star Walk. Okay. We're going to move past that. I'm so sorry. You know, our university also put in a whole new phone system that's all voice over IP. And so I can't dial in on the university phone system because the Internet is out evidently university-wide. <laughs> Gotta love technology, right? Okay. So I'm going to have you move ahead, if you would, to um, – the slide that says gameplay facilitates teaching. Got it. Okay. So gameplay facilitates teaching because it enables exploration, but also gameplay usually benefits from a more capable other. Let's go forward and take a look at the Math Next slide. Math Next games, there are four content for kids that they learn in. Okay. Did we lose you again? Okay, can you still hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, gosh, what is going on? <laughs> oh, I, we are really trying, aren't we? She may be on a cell phone if the university system is out, and I wonder if her cell phone reception is not good. Because that call dropped. You can't see that, but I can see that the call actually dropped. We we may be having two post conference keynotes. <laughs> I don't want to ask her to do this twice, but she may want to do it again. check my email, although it's unlikely I'll have gotten an email from her at this stage. Oh, looks like she's coming in again. Are you back with us? Hey, guys. <laughs> the most technical problems I think I've ever had. Well, I don't want you to feel like you would have to do this again, but if you wanted to do this next week, you would be welcome to. <laughs> that is so kind of you, but let's go ahead. I'm, I'm looking at the time. Let me go through and um, go to the, if you would, go to the slide that has the frog on it. And thank you all for your patience. I am so sorry. I, since the phone goes in and out, I'm pretty sure it's Internet University-wide that's having problems, probably because of that rain we've been having. We're on the frog. Okay. So I want to tell you a story about frog dissection. My son, same son as the earlier story. He gives me lots of inspiration. Um, I have I review apps for different folks. And so I have a bunch of apps on my, on my iPad. Some I buy purposely and some I don't. And he kept going to this frog dissection, and this is before he could read. And it's a, it's a pretty app. It's just a page-turning app. You go through at least the part where you um, dissect a frog, and you go through and you draw the lines on the frog, and you cut them, and you open them up, and you can read about it. And I kept telling him, oh, honey, that's too old for you. This is, this is, for, this is for older kids. And he kept going to this app. He loved going to this app and going through and dissecting the frog. And we went to Graham's and Granddad's house, and we have a rule generally where they don't get to play iPads with Grams and Granddad unless they're playing with Grams and Granddad. And so um, Carter came and said, I want to borrow the iPad. And I said, why? And he said, I want to show Grams what the inside of a frog looks like. And I was so taken because we sometimes give our kids access 
to all sorts of different content. And sometimes we intentionally keep them away from content we don't think they're interested in. And I never would have thought to give a kindergarten student the opportunity to dissect a frog. Now, I don't think for a moment that he has taken away from dissecting a frog what a high school or a middle school or a college student would. But he learns that there is a scientific process we use. He learns the joy of discovering. He learns the joy of going through those self-guided learning himself and asking questions, all of those things that you might have written down at the beginning of this talk on paper and pencil that make a difference for learning, he learned those things. And you can learn those in excellent gameplay. Dan uh, White from Filament made such a great point in his talk earlier, and he said, you know, every game changes the methodology in the classroom. Some games are meant to be exploration and discovery and to have great discussion. Some games are meant for the kids to explore, and some kids are meant to be shorter form. Some games are meant to be longer form. But all games for game-based learning can be made and can be used in a way that facilitates these things that create deep learn great learning. Um, in, in the interest of time, I, I would ask if you would, Steve, there's there's one more video I want you to watch on your own, and that is a video of Glee Karaoke. I'm going to tell you the story, and then when we're done, I'd like you to go watch that. But Glee Karaoke is a, it's a little karaoke game that's based on the TV show where kids or users can go in and, and register, and they can um, um, sing songs, and they can like any karaoke act. They can kind of listen to their own voice and see how they do. And I have some slides there if you're going to go through and show those, Steve, if you would, that just kind of show the interface on that. And what's neat about it is you can register, and it'll show while you're singing, if you want it to, where in the world you are. And then you can click on another user someplace in that world, and you can sing a duet real time. It's amazing, and it's just a little game. But a couple of years ago, when the tsunami happened in Japan, this community did what all of us did in the face of a tragedy. When we have a tragedy, we all seek other people to share it with, to understand it with. And so this community came together and said, let's all get together at the same time and sing a song of support for Japan. And they all got together all around the world, and they all at the same time sang, stand by me for the survivors of the tsunami. And the video when you watch it is tremendously powerful to see this community of, of users who had sung together and given points to each other and ranked each other singing all come together and experience this. And I will tell you as a cynic that they didn't actually do anything for the victims of Japan. They didn't raise any money. You know, they didn't raise awareness necessarily. But I don't think that's what it was designed to do. It was designed not to help the people in Japan as much as it helped the people who were doing the singing. Because Glee Karaoke gave them a community, a community of people to share things with, to learn from each other, to celebrate with, and to experience tragedy with. And it doesn't matter that it happened on an app. It doesn't matter that it happened in pixel form. But it matters that it happened. So Steve, if you would go through and step through these next slides. If people ask, can gameplay help people learn, and people ask you that, you can tell them that it absolutely can, and it does, and it will. Because gameplay changes things. Education changes things. But more importantly, teaching changes things. Because we change things. It's not about the device. It's not about the iPad or the mobile. What matters is about the activity they are doing. So when it comes time for us to talk to people about gameplay, don't talk to them about gameplay. Talk to them about solving problems. Talk to them about collaborating. Talk to them about collecting data. Talk to them about analyzing data. Talk about them about sharing and solving problems. That's the kind of game-based learning that everybody can sign on and feel good about. And with that, my contact information is on the last slide. You're happy to contact me either through Twitter or email. And if you have any questions in the two minutes remaining, I'd be happy to answer those. And thanks again for your patience with these, with these challenges. I think we're going to give you the award for uh, uh, overcoming the most technical obstacles for the conference. <laughs> nice job. Does anybody have a quick question? We are two minutes away from finishing. I'll let you put it in the chat or you can raise your hand.
Otherwise, I think a huge round of applause and thank you from us here. Good luck getting home, I guess. <laughs> you know, we live in the desert. We have rain. We are happy to have it. It, it is kind of funny. It makes you realize, you know, we get just like we'll get three inches or something all in one day, and it just it slows our city down as it as it does today. And I suspect those internet problems are are related. Um, you did a terrific job overcoming them. <laughs> okay, I think we'll we'll close out there. Uh, Barbara's contact information is on the slide. The recording will be up if you would like to watch it again. And uh, thank you so much. Oh, you know, it's it's uh, thank you. It's such a wonderful opportunity. I really appreciate it, and thank you all for um for not only including me but for thinking to ask me in the first place. This is a neat thing you're doing. What a terrific way to end the day. It makes us appreciate the technology. Thanks to Barbara. Thanks to all of you. We will have one final session next week as Michael Levine comes back to to give his keynote. We've had a really great day, Allison. Thank you for your support and all the great organizing. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye now.